to your audience and their life, their life. Can you text them? Well, a couple of minutes, they will be like, Hi, uh, my name is Teresa Frontado, I'm the Digital Director of WLRN and this afternoon I have the distinct pleasure of being here uh, in the house of Richard Blanco's parents in Westchester, Miami with two wonderful Cuban American writers, Ruth Behar and Richard Blanco, who graciously uh, you, you <laughs> volunteer your parents' house. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking um, about an upcoming trip that they are um, taking to the island. So let's start with Ruth. Um, how are you, Ruth? I'm great. Glad <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Enjoying being here in this uh, lovely backyard that where Richard grew up. Yeah. It's just lovely, lovely breeze and delicious being here. <laughs> very different from Michigan where you usually live. Yes, very different from Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the trip that you guys are about to um, start. Well, Richard and I are leading a group of Cuba One participants and these are young Cuban Americans um, between the ages of 22 and 35 who have never been to Cuba. Uh, they've heard about Cuba probably all their lives from their families and friends and so on. And so it's their first opportunity to go and learn about Cuba from uh, two Cuba experts, or at least two <laughs> Cuba obsessives like, like Richard and me. <laughs> and it's my understanding that this trip in particular is different because of the fact that you two are leading it. So it has a literary twist, right? Um, tell us a little bit what does that entail? Well, what are you gonna what are, what are you gonna be doing? Who well, you're gonna be we're meeting? gonna do a couple of things. We're going to Richard and I are going to lead some writing workshops while we're in Cuba. So actually, get the participants to process what they're experiencing and seeing and thinking about and dreaming about while they're there. So we've got the actual writing. We're actually gonna do writing while we're there and then um, we're also going to meet with writers in Cuba and with a wonderful book artist named Rolando Estevez who's made it now we're, he's going to launch a beautiful book of, of Richard's uh, poetry and um, some of my poetry as well so they're going to get to meet this actual book artist and learn how he makes these books he's a total private entrepreneur now who's making books uh, the only book art independent book artist in Cuba so that's going to be very fun. We're going to meet with the director of La Opera de la Calle, the street opera company, and see them do a rehearsal of one of their shows. We're going to meet with some writers. We're meeting with hip hop artists and some visual artists as well. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So Richard, I understand this is not the first trip of this kind that you participate in. Um, no, pretty much. I've never done a trip with Cuba One uh, oh. before. Um, uh, I've gone, uh, mostly actually I've gone to see family uh, mm -hmm. since my first trip in 1994, um, which is interesting because it's, it's sort of a whole other, it's a, a whole other dimension, right? So in some ways I haven't seen much of Cuba because I, I'm always with family and that's, you know, again since 94. And actually Ruth and I uh, went just before the reopening of the U.S. Embassy, which was my first cultural trip, and I was in Ruth's hands, which I finally went as a, as a writer to Cuba, you know, finally met some writers and sort of did more cultural things. And it's really almost embarrassing sometimes because people that, you know, American tourists that go sometimes have seen more things about Cuba than, than I have. And that's why I'm also very excited about on top of everything else, I'm excited by this itinerary too because I feel like one of the I feel like one of the kids too <laughs> that's going, <laughs> and that Ruth has put together uh, has really helped and been instrumental in in, in, in uh, connecting with all these writers and all the people, you know, all all those groups and people and writers that she mentioned. So I'm sort of a kid in a candy shop too, um, and so so it's it's always been you know a lot of my family is now here. A lot originally that grew up in Cuba that I grew up not knowing are living here in Miami so as every time I go to Cuba there's less and less of my generation there's also the older generation is some have died off and so uh, so it's kind of like I'm exploring a new Cuba uh, mm -hmm. um, this time um, and uh, Ruth and I always talk about the sort of 
or she's always taken more cultural trips because she's not an absolute big family on like I did. And every time I go, it's like and just they lock me up someplace and we kill pigs and eat and you know like <laughs> so there's the Cuba last time we sort of shared Cubas like mm -hmm. I showed her my my family and you know in the sugar cane and the centrales mm -hmm. you know and and the big family on and then she showed me sort of the more cultural Cuba that I had never so <laughs> so I think this is uh, I think the trip is a little bit of both because we also try to I, I think Cuba one also tries to connect there's uh, uh, some participants that have family that they've never seen so that's part of it too you know to connect them with family mm -hmm. These are the sounds of Westchester. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> and I think she just mispronounced that. Wichette. Wichette. Okay. With the umlauts. <laughs> Wichette, yes. As we say before, we are visiting, we have the privilege of visiting uh, Richard Blanco's parents' house here in Westchester. They were gracious enough to let us do this in their backyard, so we're very happy and it's is actually a very pretty place. Uh, with, yeah, uh, I planted this tree with my grandmother actually about 30 years ago, so wow. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. All the memories. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of memories, take us back to 1994. You said it was your first kind of trip as an adult to mm -hmm. the island. Um, what, what did it mean to you? Um, well, I mean, it, it's I mean, you can imagine how amazing it was. I wasn't born in Cuba, so I uh, had no memories of Cuba. So much like much like these kids, uh, I keep on calling them kids. They're like very accomplished adults, actually. But these youths, maybe. Um, uh, I wasn't born in Cuba, so I had it was all like sort of just you know, sort of an, a real but imagined world. It was all like photographs, stories, family stories, things like that. So um, I was about that age, 20-something, where, you know, you ask those big questions. Like, you start asking, well, where am I from? What does this really mean? What is this Cuba people have been talking about in my family and in Miami for so long? And uh, it was that quintessential sort of coming of age. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you will probably there see. The there goes the tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, there goes our... Our, our super intern Isabella Cueto is going to go and ask the neighbor if we can drill a little bit later. We're so sorry. But this is part of the Westchester soundtrack. <laughs> this is the same neighbors from the memoir. Here you are so. in your very emotional memory of when you first went to Cuba. Yeah. No, no. And so I think that that's part of it. It was, um, you know, that you go with these big questions and you need to see, you know, you need to see if this all this stuff was really real. Like there's a... There's, you know, the, f the 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 actual physical landscapes and the people you need to touch and smell and hear and to sort of just really make it real to you. And it's it's just part of I think everybody goes through a coming of age mm -hmm. uh, in some ways. In our case, as Cuban Americans, I call it a cultural coming of age. So I think that's also very important. And why I want to be there for them is like kind of to guide them through that. Uh, well, not guide them, but be there for mm -hmm. them. Uh, and why I love what Cuba One does is because, you know, I wish there was an organization like that when I was searching for those the, the, uh, for those answers or at least investigating those questions. So mm -hmm. that's part of what's wrapped up into all this. It's uh, and, it, you know, it, it was an amazing experience, as you can imagine, it's filled in so many blanks, filled, answered so many questions. Um, and it allowed me to move forward with my life um, in a way that was um, was foundational. Mm -hmm. You were born in Cuba. And a, a big part of your writing has been exploring uh, your family's past and, and kind of trajectory mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the, the Jewish identity. And mm -hmm. a lot of people have, I've heard this comparison a lot of Cuba One to Birthright, you know, the, this yes. uh, trip that, um, that young people take to Israel. Is that, is that a fair comparison, do you think? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a comparison that the Cuba One founders make themselves. They, they modeled Cuba One on the birthright concept. The idea of giving the birthright concept with Israel is giving Jewish kids the opportunity to go to Israel, also on an all-expense-paid trip and get mm -hmm. to know their, their Jewish roots in Israel. So Cuba One is modeled on that concept. It doesn't receive any funding from, you know, birthright Israel, but the idea comes from there. And I think it's a very interesting one because the Jews are a diasporic people or historically were a people of a diaspora and Cubans have become so as well. Cubans are people, so many Cubans live 
outside of the island. So the, the Cuban and the Jewish experience mm -hmm. separately have a lot of things in common. And as you said, in my case, I have both of those experiences as a, as a Juban, as they say in Miami. <laughs> I, mean, I love it that here in Miami, it's not a weird thing. If you start telling people, I'm Cuban, but I'm also Jewish, I go, yeah, you're a Juban. I go, oh, okay. So I don't have to explain <laughs> anything. Now in, in Michigan, you have to explain, I'm Jewish, I'm Cuban. How is that possible that you have one Jewish parent and one Cuban parent? I'll go, no, they're both Jewish and Cuban and it's just it's a weird identity I think anywhere else but in Miami where there's such a large Jewish Cuban community and three synagogues here founded by Jewish Cubans so so there's a community here and it's understood that we're a part of this Cuban diaspora and so on my trips to Cuba I started going my very first trip was in 1979 and talk about wishing that there had been something like Cuba one <laughs> then yeah, because really then it. you really needed it I went with a group of students and professors I was at Princeton then and that trip it was a one-week trip and it was like a hallucination I don't think I understood anything that was going on at all um, but then I started going in 91 I made um, a decision that I wanted to normalize my own relationship with Cuba and reconnect with the island a lot of us who left as children feel that we left our childhood back mm -hmm. on the island that there's this kind of parallel life we might have lived and so I've had for many, many years, the desire to go back and stand in the places where I stood as a child, where there are pictures of me in front of the synagogue or in a park. And I've had to go back to those places and kind of stand in those places again, sort of re reclaim them. Um, so that was really what I was doing in the early trips when I first started going in the early 90s. And then, and then I started writing poems because it was so emotional and I would cry so much on those first trips. And I even had these terrible panic attacks. Where I was just really nervous and shaking. And I think it was just a very strong emotional response. My parents haven't been back. I was the first in the family to go back and they weren't that happy about my going back. So I think I felt a lot of uncertainty about being there and it kind of manifested in these panic attacks and this fear but I forced myself to keep going back and get over the fear and and feel that that I belong there too that I still have a sense of home there and that I can go back when I want to and that was very important to me and then finding my counterparts I had to find the people around my age whose parents had decided to stay in Cuba mm -hmm. and I wanted to know them and know like how are they like me and how are they not like me and that's how I reached out to a lot of these writers and artists that we're going to meet on this trip. These are people that became my counterparts. They were the ones whose parents chose to stay. And I needed that bridge to, to my fellow Cubans of my generation. So that was one very important step that I took. And it was really, like Richard said, it was like really finding spiritual closure, but also kind of spiritual opening by doing that. And then reaching out to the Jewish community and um, Initially, I would just hang out in the synagogues in Havana and meet people. I didn't want to study them because it felt mm -hmm. somehow wrong to go there and study people as an anthropologist. And so I would just hang out in the synagogues, get to know people. And over the course of many, many years, I started getting to know everybody in the community and then started filming and recording and writing about the community and feel very, very connected to this small Jewish community in Cuba and Havana and I've also traveled all over the island finding the Jews mm -hmm. left in Cuba and it's been a really um, amazing amazing thing for me to find that Jewish part of my heritage that's on the island and my Jewish family always felt that they had found a refuge in Cuba they loved Cuba and like other Cubans they were so sad to leave the island. My maternal grandmother, who was from Poland, always talked about how she never felt anti-Semitism in Cuba, that she felt so at home there. She didn't feel the hatred she had felt in Poland. And for her, it was really a new beginning. And there was so much sadness when she had to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that has given me a sense of gratitude towards Cuba, that Cuba saved my family from the Holocaust, literally, because the members of the family who stayed in Europe perished in the Holocaust, right? So, so Cuba became the country 
that saved us, and I think that's why I feel such a such a deep connection to Cuba, among other reasons. But that's that's a big one. And um, for the Cuba One participants, the ones who would like to go on a Saturday morning and see a Shabbat service in Havana, that will be a poss one of the options for those who would like to go. I'll I'll take people who want to see mm -hmm. that that segment of Cuban life. Um. Like I said, in, in both of your, I'm, I'm sorry, let me remind our audience that we are uh, today, we're talking to two great Cuban American writers. Uh, we have Richard Blanco, a uh, poet, and we have Ruth Behar, who's a writer and a poet too. Uh, and they're talking about their upcoming trip to Cuba. They're um, visiting the island with a group of young Cuban American artists, right? Um, what's the profile of the group that you're that you're leading? There, um, it's sort of a literature, literary focus group. So there's there's writers, journalists, one graphic novelist, right? Um, there's one uh, uh, Alex Fumero, right, who, who wrote um, Hialeah Haikus. Oh, oh my God, <laughs> I have it! I have it! Yes, is it I, 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 yeah, yeah, I told yeah. him like I've kept this book like for years now. So you know, it's a literary, and, and Cuba One sort of does always the trip a little bit focused, uh, like on a theme, right? Mm -hmm. With us, as ob the obvious is the writing and the poetry, and and a little bit of journalism too. Like, were we meeting with some journalists? Maybe uh, we're meeting, we, we that's might. Right. We're meeting with some journalists, journalists. as well, some uh, foreign journalists based in Cuba and Cuban. Mm -hmm. journalists as well there's yeah. a couple in the group yeah. but it brings up a point because part of what I love about about this program is that it's not just about it's not just about going to Cuba and sort of oh I went to Cuba and mm -hmm. like oh and I reconnected with my roots and all this stuff but it's really about using their talents to give back in the sense of there's the I and I'm not sure if it's completely articulated in writing but it's part of what is sort of the concept is for them to come back, whether you're a painter or a photographer or a writer or a graphic novelist or a journalist, and sort of connect them with a story, but also sort of use your talents to keep on telling that story. Because you know how it, you know how Cuba, the whole Cuban and Cuban American story in the diaspora is so it's so wrapped in misconception and myth and. And even for Cuban Americans, I mean, something you know, we we go to Cuba expecting this one thing, and it's something else. So part of their story is to serve as the, that cultural bridge to mm -hmm. sort of to sort of keep on telling the story of Cuba, Cubans on the island, Cubans in the wor in the world, Cubans in the United States, and sort of continuing that cultural dialogue. And so I think that's interesting, and I think that's kind of their charge, which is like, how can you use what you do to to brought it you know open up that story beyond the typical you know i want to go to cuba before i change its story kind of feeling you know like yeah. there's a whole <laughs> lot of history that we, that uh, that we've lost out on um and that we don't know about and so then again it's it's not about the political thing it's just their stories there's mm -hmm. real people's lives that i mean when ruth and i started uh bridges to cuba it was out of kind of which is a blog um bridges to and from cuba which was just like, because you watch the news and we just kind of like, it's like so one dimensional about what these stories were. And, uh, you know, just, it's not just the story of Cuban and Cubans or Cuban Americans here, but it's also like, there was a diaspora, like it was saying, all over the world. But also the Cubans and Americans, there's real lives and stuff. There's great stories, funny stories, sad stories. How do we, how do we broaden that spectrum of, of, of you know, what that story means mm -hmm. uh, and carry it forward? So it's also generational because I think. Um, ya nosotros nos estamos poniendo viejitos, you know. Like, <laughs> no, tampoco. <laughs> yeah. The first day they got us going from like four in the morning to like nine thirty at night. We're like, what? Did I? <laughs> no they're, they're younger. They're younger. They're young. So it's like, so it's funny. I'm like, I gotta just get, you know, get, I started taking vitamin C already. <laughs> But I uh. <laughs> What was I say? I lost my point. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about the narrative and um, oh, the generational yeah. thing. So, so that I think what it is is partly to at least I feel is why I like the work they're doing is that they're the you know they're the heir apparent of these stories, right? And also of the possible full reconciliation down the line, you know. And and you have the counterparts in Cuba, like. Like Ruth was saying, there's these counterparts which exist. So there's the youth in Cuba too that that sort of relate to 
to that they relate to in a very different way than we could, right? Like they like skateboarding and things like that, mm -hmm. like graphic novels, mm -hmm. like. And so there's there's the counterparts of generational, and it, and it's up to the generations as it is always historically. Just shows in the in the end, um, maybe continue writing that story and continue, you know, or whatever that may mean. And mm -hmm. so. You know, the older Cubans have in, here and in and in Cuba, you know, have obviously many have passed on. Um, my mother's already 80, 81. Um, She's going to kill you for revealing her age on air. <laughs> 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 oh, she's the first one to say, yeah, te mira, tengo uh, but any, And then we're, we've done our work. I mean, we've tried to contribute what we can, but there is the sense that there's another generation. And so part of our thing is to sort of fill them in on like sort of mm -hmm. what's going on literarily, emotionally, all the rest. Mm -hmm. So that's part of part of what this trip, why I get excited about about th this trip in particular, but also um, Cuba One in general as a foundation. Cuba has played such an important role in your writing, and I mean yours and the both of you. In your, uh, and it has, you know, a, a certain narrative. Do you feel recent events are going to change that narrative and I think it's kind of I'm trying to piggyback on what you were saying um, what is what are these these stories that are still out there to be told right. sure well I mean I think the you know the family stories will continue I don't think those will change too drastically I think that there's been this opening the families were very divided in the early years of the revolution as we all know tremendous divisions ideological and political divisions and there's a famous photograph by Jose Figueroa who lives in Cuba still and it's a photograph where you see a hand and then you see a woman down below like going walking towards a plane and in that photograph he was actually waving goodbye to his own mother as she was leaving um, and it's the photograph is called exile or exilio and this was in the 60s and he couldn't leave Cuba because he was a teenager he was of military age and he stayed and his mother and other family members left so so there was tremendous division and for many years people didn't communicate with each other because of these ideological divisions throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s and then that opened up in the 90s and people started communicating again brothers and sisters who hadn't talked to each other started talking to each other in part because there was such a huge economic crisis in Cuba after the fall of the Soviet Union but nevertheless there was this opening again and people starting to reconnect after a long period of, of serious serious division and serious falling apart of the nation I, I view the Cuban Revolution as almost a civil war people really did divide up because of their ideology and that started changing in the 90s and we've seen it change even more in the last five or ten years and certainly since Obama was in Cuba this this opening has been very very important and has given people permission essentially to go to Cuba to visit Cuba to get to know Cuba as a culture and not just as a political system I think that's been very important it's allowed families to reunite and so I think those stories have started evolving you know now um, in these last few years but they they began to be told in the early 90s during that period of opening and now I think this is going to continue I think there are more and more interchanges and exchanges going on between Cubans on the island and off the island exchanges around art literature things like that cultural aspects of our um, of our lives and Richard was talking about filling in gaps and I think that the gaps need to be filled on all sides so to speak because in Cuba there's a lot that they want to know about the exile community or about those who left because that's part of their lives too because everybody in Cuba either has somebody who's left or knows somebody who has left maybe had a, a, a you know a dear friend at school who like mm -hmm. one day their family was leaving right so so there's as, as much curiosity on mm -hmm. their side as there is on our side and I think that's one of the things that the Cuba one participants will learn I think you know really acquiring a multi perspectival view is very important and I think about this too as an anthropologist which is kind of the mission of anthropology is to gain more perspectives be able to look at the world from different angles and not just one angle you know so I think that's what people will be able to gain in Cuba and this will enrich the stories they tell about themselves their family their community they've heard about Cuba they've inherited memories of Cuba but now they're going to acquire their own mm -hmm. 
memories of Cuba, um, which doesn't mean that the inherited memories aren't important because those are very much the filters through which we see Cuba, but we get to add other filters by going there ourselves and, you know, and seeing it firsthand. I think that's very important. And I remember those first few trips to Cuba when, <laughs> when I would hear Cuban Spanish, you know, being spoken and, you know, somebody would say, we had un piñazo. And I think, piñazo, I know that word. <laughs> Not an ice word, you know, I'm going to punch this person. But I remember, you know, hearing that, like one of my aunts saying that to one of my, we had un piñazo, si no, si no, si no te callas la boca, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then, you know, you, you'd hear that, that Cuban Spanish wherever you went, <laughs> which of course is normal because it's Cuban Spanish, but, but, you know, but it was one thing to have heard it in my family or in certain pockets in Miami, but then to go and there's like a whole country <laughs> that speaks like that and that has, you know, a similar sense of humor and has a similar spirit. I think that is so, um, so incredible. And I think that will enrich people's stories to realize that there's so much that unites us, mm -hmm. you know, despite all these separations that were real and we should definitely continue to be real for many people. I think the separations are still there for many, but there's so much that unites us at the same time. And I think that that's my sense of this bridge back and forth that there's so much that unites us culturally how we are our gestures our way of speaking our way of remembering our our sentimentality which is very very huge for cubans cubans i think to generalize a little bit tend to have this huge you know, huge emotional you know component to to the way they respond to things so i think that is so incredible and i don't think the either political system the political system in the united states or in cuba is going to infringe upon that and my sense is that the bridge has opened so much in these last few years that that all these attempts at closure are not going to work um, you know there may be things that will not be permitted for americans to do but i think that they're going to be very few because i think the bridge is now there and i think people want the bridge to continue i think there's a lot of cubans who've come to miami more recently in the last five to ten years or last 20 years and they continue to stay very connected to cuba unlike that earlier generation that we're a part of that really broke with cuba um, and had a hard time reconnecting those who've left more recently still feel connected to the island mm -hmm. they still have family there you know they were there recently and and that's still very much a part of their lives and their presence in miami and in the United States has changed the way Cubans in the diaspora view the island. So I think that that shift is that demographic shift is very important and I think that's going to continue and I don't think that the political you know process on either side can stop that. I think that we're like too far along mm -hmm. in the bridge making to be able to go backwards now. Yeah I, I think there's a definitely um that was one of the most eye-opening things for me when I went to Cuba was that whole realizing that they were ga their gaze upon us was part of their story, right? Because I, you know, you grew up here with the sense of oh, our story comes from this place, and talking to my cousins and how you know all the photographs back then from Cuba were like black and white mm -hmm. and like you know in a backyard somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then they would tell me, and all your color, all your photographs were in color, and like, you know, my mom always taking pictures when we went to a nice party or something like that, always dressed up, and so, so it was this weird uh, sort of, um, always uh, mystif, myst sort of, we, this mystery back and forth, and sort of coming face to face was just this sort of great connection of finally seeing breaking through that 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 mystery um but it's interesting because all my cousins all my first cousins um uh, that i grew up with grew up without they all my mother's entire family stayed in cuba her eight brothers and sisters all my first cousins with the exception of one live in miami now <laughs> and now uh we even my second cousins are starting to come in and and it's true they go it, it's not it's no longer this kind of like you know this idea of immigration like it was in the it, like it was in, in the 1800s but also I was in Cuban New Year like you said goodbye and that was it mm -hmm. like now in, in a weird way their their connection to Cuba is very different there there's a whole generation now that grew up post Soviet Union mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so they're just trying to sort of make a better life for themselves kind of thing and just as soon as they can get unos queritos together they go back to Cuba to see their family try to help them out where they can so it's this whole continuous uh, uh, a connection and a communication like never before in a way that's happening globally in the way that we you know you can't stop this global narrative of people connecting even though we would try to revert to that other narrative of exclusion versus inclusion 
but um, as far as what, what, how I'm th sort of thinking about that in my own work, because it's something I constantly obviously think about, the, the reading it and, and that Ruth was there at the reopening of, of the Cuban uh, U.S. Embassy in Havana, and having read, having to have written that poem and read it there, it was a very seminal moment because there was, it was almost like, it was something, something shifted in me and, and in a, and in a, not in a good or in a bad way, just something shifted. It was felt like the, the closing of one chapter and the beginning of another in terms of, and I think that has to do also with what I'm feeling like the generational stuff. You have to continue writing the book, you know, but it, it felt like there was another kind of, and I'm still sort of exploring another thing to think about that isn't just the, you know, this sort of black and white as it was before. There's this whole other dialogue, and I, I'm and I'm, I'm I mean, there's so many stories that I hope get written too that I can't write them because they're not my experience. Mm -hmm. But like my cousins that came here when they're 22, you know, or my cousin just came a few months ago, you know, I I hope those stories. I mean, I maybe I'm supposed to do them for them. I'm not sure, but. But I, I noticed that there was an evolution, and um, and it was and it was largely sort of thinking about home, not just in my own little world, and, but really thinking about what home and, na and nationality means in the context of family and and this geopolitical world that we live in now. So, uh, yeah, it's a wide open door. The story's not done, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. So one last thing um, that I want to ask you um, for each of you. Um, an ad advice, a word of advice to these 11 young artists, Cuban-American artists that are coming. Sure. Uh, it's their first time in Cuba. What is your advice to them? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we had, um, it's funny because uh, we kind of uh, had an exercise in that because uh, Cuba One asked many authors, journalists, to with that same question. They wrote, they wrote little postcards and then they mailed them to, to the participants. Uh, and part of my advice was that um, was was kind of like look, you may, Cuba's going to answer a lot of questions and fill a lot of blanks, but it might you might leave with more questions and more <laughs> blanks than you came in with, and just to know that that's okay, that it's a journey. This is not this seems in some ways like the end, like this place you've been trying to get to, but it's also the beginning of a journey, and. Uh, and that yeah that it's it's both the, the beginning and the end the beginning the end and the beginning of a story that they need to keep on writing and that's kind of was was my advice to that it's okay to live in the question you know it's not everything's going to be answered and how about you Ruth? <laughs> on the spot <laughs> on the spot well i think what what i wrote um in that regard too was i think uh, giving people permission to be open to all the emotions they're going to feel um, in Cuba. And I wrote about how I had a lot of complex emotions when I went back, you know, fear and panic mm -hmm. <laughs> and uncertainty and crying a lot. And, and, and I said, well, it's okay to feel all that. This is very, very intense. We're carrying a lot of history, a lot of baggage. We were talking about that the other day, carrying a lot of emotional baggage from our families. And particularly if you're the first one to be going back to Cuba, in your family so give yourself permission to feel all that to to be sad to cry to also be joyful but give yourself permission to experience all the emotions that you're going to feel it's probably going to be a gamut of emotions that are going to be very strange and confused and it's going to be joy in one way and feeling like wow i'm finally here <laughs> this is it i'm you know here i am walking on the malecon and it's like wow a feeling of exhilaration but there also may be some sadness and melancholy and and just thinking about everything that was lost also and that's one of the feelings that I had when I first started going to Cuba was going now I understand why my parents were so sad mm -hmm. this is what they lost this is a beautiful country this is a beautiful island and and I felt that loss and that made me cry at mm -hmm. the same time so I think to to give yourself permission to feel that complexity of emotions and and to allow that heart opening to take place because I think that's what what we all need is to allow the heart to open and really let Cuba come in everything <laughs> everything that it stands for and bring that into ourselves as as writers and artists well, thank you very much, Richard Blanco and Ruth Behar, two Cuban-American authors um, that uh, took time to talk to us this afternoon from the patio of <laughs> Richard's house in Westchester with a soundtrack of the, the, the wind and the neighbor. Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience and have a wonderful trip. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>